This is a Digital Music Trends, episode 168 on the 29th of January 2014. This week on the show, SoundCloud's new round, Last FM and YouTube, Grammys 2014, Prince sues fans, then takes it back, Rap Genius's app, news from China, Sweden and more. If you're watching the video version, unfortunately we had a major glitch this week, but fear not, a whole new setup will come into play post medium, so please bear with us for this week. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Linelli and this is a weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. DMT is available as audio and video on a variety of channels including the iTunes Store, most podcasting app including Downcast, YouTube, Mixcloud, Soundcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio and Audioboo. And to get in touch with the show you can tweet us on at DigiMusicTrends or email us on contact at DigitalMusicTrends.com. Uh, on DigitalMusicTrends.com you will also actually find a subscription, a voluntary subscription now uh, for the podcast uh, if you want to contribute and you enjoy the show every week, you can go on digitalmusictrends.com and you'll find all the details on the right-hand side of the screen. And this week, it's a real pleasure to welcome to the show uh, two get ga- great guests. I've got a third one in the wings. Hopefully, uh, she'll sort, sa- sh- sort out her sky problems and will be able to join us in a second. Uh, but first of all, uh, a great welcome, uh, Clyde Smith uh, from Hypebox uh, back to the show. So hi, Clyde, and great to have you on. Great to be here. Uh, Clyde, uh, Clyde writes uh, some great pieces of music tech on HypeBot.com and he's also really interested in crowdfunding, so he's got a lot of expertise in that field. So uh, really great to have you on today. Uh, actually, uh, we might touch upon the, uh, um, uh, the Indiegogo uh, f- fundraiser that was announced uh, this week as well, so that, that could be pretty cool. And uh, also, it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Pete Jimison as a guest on our show. Uh, after taking part uh, uh, of a, to a one-to-one show uh, in 2013, and uh, Pete uh, comes from the company F Sharp, uh, which specializes in connecting brands and consumers through music. So, hey, Pete, uh, great to have you on, and how's it going? Good. Thanks for having me, Andrew. It's great to have you. And so this week, we're going to start uh, by talking about SoundCloud. So SoundCloud uh, is a company that uh, we haven't really opened the show with SoundCloud in a while because we didn't have um, many uh, big news coming from, from the service. Uh, but uh, last week, uh, we learned that the company's rate closed a new round for $60 million, uh, putting its valuation at around $700 million, as reported by the Wall Street Journal. The round was led by institutional venture partners and the Shernin Group uh, with the uh, participation of previous investors like Union Square and Index ventures, amongst others, of course. Uh, and uh, Record reports that SoundCloud is going to start, uh, or has already started, actually, uh, uh, looking at doing deals with labels to license the content uh, properly. Uh, uh, and uh, But to be honest, you know, there's still a, a lot of question marks here as to how the service will progress and how those licenses will be applied and uh, what kind of scope they have. So, uh, you know, will it be a real YouTube for audio and be ad-funded? Will it turn into a subscription service? What is going to happen to that? So, uh, Pete, first of all, you know, what are your thoughts uh, on the fundraise and on the potential evolution of the service for you? Oh, well, it's interesting. You know, I think that uh, SoundCloud, like it, it mentioned in a few articles, it's got all sorts of directions it could head, which right. is, uh, I think, very uh, interesting for SoundCloud versus, you know, some of the other players out there when you talk about streaming music like Spotify, Mardio, et cetera. Um, you know, because they have kind of a great community of creatives and they're known for that, um, I think that, you know, the focus on audio and, and, and creation and um, basically the community coming together and working with each other, that's always been a large part of SoundCloud. Um, so uh, the whole idea of getting, getting into the licensing model and, and pr- new content and competing with the likes of a Spotify, um, you know, obviously, they, I'm not sure how they're entertaining that, but to me, there's already so many uh, competitors out there. And when people compare them to somebody like a, a YouTube um, you know, YouTube music's coming out and YouTube already has all the eyes for the, for the music. To me, it wouldn't make sense for SoundCloud to try to get into that uh, yeah. area. I think they should stay with that artist community, with the, you know, just the creators that they already have and build off that and become much more focused on audio um, and expanding their reach. I mean, they, they, you know, they can sit, they, they sit internationally, you don't have to worry about licensing because everybody has the content rights. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of that's initial. That's yeah, your thoughts on that. Uh, Clyde, uh, you know, we're looking at a company with a, a very high valuation and, uh, you know, uh, Pete's talking about uh, concentrating on, on curators and, and on creators of music, uh, uh, especially. But, you know, is that sustainable for a company that has got such a high valuation and that, of course, plans on, on expanding in the long term, right? Wow, that's a good question. Um, I'd love to know how much they make from their subscriptions and premium services. I mean, they're... Yeah. That would tell us a lot in terms of evaluating, like, how what they've done could grow or where they'd be at. I mean, we'd know how much, it'd be nice to know how much money they're making. And 
obviously that always helps. Um, I'm not sure moving forward. I mean, I like what they're doing. They just de- de- debuted a new player, I That's think, right. today or yesterday or something. That looks cool. Uh, in terms of uh, maybe advertising as well, that, that could be quite interesting. I, you know, this whole the thing is, there's so many music services that are now trying to be ad supported, and there's going to be a lot more. And I really wonder about that ad inventory, to be honest. Um, and I, I'm hate I hate the thing of put an ad on everything. You know, it's like there's already a lot of ad. ad there's so much advertising that's kind of canceling each other out. Right. And that said, I mean, I could see a little ad unit on that player doing well, but. I don't know. It's just beyond that. It's it's hard to see though where they're going because when they talk about the future, they talk about audio becoming this thing that will start posting just like people post little video clips of their dog or whatever. But yeah, it's kind of a human. It's a behavior that isn't that widespread. So I don't I don't yeah. know how they'll get there. Yeah. The, the thing is though is that it, it, a lot of advertisers are going towards this content generation. So you look at what they're, they're providing for an advertiser to just create music or create uh, audio files and then actually put onto SoundCloud and have all of that real estate with that new player to actually showcase the brand um, mm-hmm. and the brand with the sponsoring. So I think that itself could open it up. And it doesn't, that doesn't resonate as much as like your normal advertising, like an advertising banner as it is more right. of a, a you know, sponsorship or just sure. like, the brand showing some of the cool stuff it's doing. Yeah, because uh, of course, you know, Pete, you have quite a bit of uh, experience in the advertising and, and music space. Uh, so SoundCloud could be an attractive property to do that on for brands, especially with this new visual play. It's, it's really stunning looking. So, uh, but, but then how, how you go about implementing that, that's a real question mark, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, so yeah, uh, you know, the new visual, visual player is out. You can actually use it on any uh, sound file that you have on SoundCloud right now. So I'd encourage you to, to check it out. I'm going to use it for uh, the show, which I always uh, do a SoundCloud embed on the site. And it looks uh, really nice, uh, actually. Uh, so uh, that's pretty cool. And also for pro users, uh, if you pause it, uh, it actually displays all the tracks you've spotlighted on the service once you pause uh, uh, the, the embedded player. So it kind of gives people a bit of a, oh, nice. an opportunity to go from one thing to the next uh, uh, within your own sort of ecosystem of, of SoundCloud. And uh, um, one company that is not doing so well is LastFM, unfortunately. Uh, you know, the, the latest beta that uh, has been demonstrated, uh, b- has been opened up by the company, shows that uh, LastFM is intending to stop its radio service, uh, move away from its own licensed radio, and start using YouTube instead. So the move is seen as a cost-cutting one, uh, you know, because uh, uh, the company has been losing money for quite some time for CBS. Uh, and uh, there's no doubt that some people are going to read this as LastFM being on its last legs. On the the other side, of course, uh, uh, linking onto YouTube means that LastFM could have a bit more uh, adoption around the world uh, since it had to close its uh, radio service in, a, in, a, in the vast majority of markets uh, uh, just over a year ago. I think uh, at the moment only the UK, US and Germany have uh, the service still going. Uh, so, you know, uh, Claudia posted a very interesting piece on Hypot about this and about uh, uh, why, you know, LastFM might actually have some troubles trying to get away from its license model. So can you elaborate a little bit on that? Well... My question, okay, when I was looking at it, um, so far I think the YouTube player has been an option people could have, and it's, I don't think they've officially said they're going to try to do that or not. Right. So, but, so obviously it's still kind of playing out, but um, my question was in terms of licensing, um, my understanding is that even if you're using things like SoundCloud and YouTube to power your music, if you get too popular, um, they'll, you'll still hear from music publishers about licensing. Yeah. And um, I would think Last FM would be aware of the implications, but, you know, so again, it's one of these things where there's stuff happening behind the scenes you don't really know, but I don't think they could just go, go for it with YouTube and get away with that from what I'm hearing from people. Yeah, yeah, and and, and uh, Peter, what do you think about, you know, Last FM as, you know, used to be a, a real Pandora competitor, but, uh, you know, it's lost that uh, race uh, quite, quite a long time ago. So, uh, yeah. what do you think it going, uh, fr- fr- what do you see it going from now on? It's got a, a huge data pool still of users that are using it to scrubble uh, music, uh, you know, that, that's really a, a, an asset still of, of the service. Uh, but yeah. as far as an uh, sort of outward facing uh, radio service, that hasn't really worked out. It, you know, what do you think they can do next? Well, I think it, this is actually inter- interesting because if you look at YouTube, again, going back to what we were saying about YouTube music and having all the content there on YouTube, 
you've got a few players that are out there now that are looking at taking that content and bringing it into their own sites um, and whatever using the purposes they already have on, let's say, Last.fm or like a wide.com. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, what, what, they're, what you end up seeing is basically they're giving a new user interface for the content. So each one of these sites is basically offering you know, the ability to maybe scrabble and, and find new music or things of that nature um, that relate back to what you have been listening to. So yeah. the essence of discovery, the things that happen with, with music, you know, that's where it comes down to is who can do that the best. And I think that's, that's, that's one thing that YouTube hasn't figured out. If you look at YouTube, it's still that standard display. And if I'm going to listen to music, I can't really go from one track to the next um, unless I just go to the related tracks on the side or I type it in. Where I think Last FM has that that upper hand because they've come from the music and they've already had the you know ability to showcase other songs and ways of getting and directing yourself through the site. So yeah, to me that's that that is definitely you know a positive for them. But where they I don't know they they seem to have lost a lot of their mojo from the past years and a lot of people have left Last FM and just don't feel as confident in the service. So yeah, um, you know to me it's I think another service will probably take over. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, we can't really, we don't really know what's going to happen or what, of course, it's all in the hands of CBS as to what they do with the company from now on and whether they might actually be able to find a, a more appropriate outlet for for the company services that they haven't really managed to capitalize themselves. I don't know, maybe that could be an option, right, Clyde, in terms of another company actually buying Last FM off them? I guess, um, man. Yeah. It's a difficult it's, one. That's hard to imagine, right? I, there are just so many services, and it's it's hard. I'm just expecting more people to drop out. So, right. if they do it through mergers, that'd be one way. But I kind of, I, I would be surprised if that happened. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, uh, we're going to keep an eye, of course, on, on what happens. And, and there's no saying, actually, that the, this uh, beta program with the YouTube implementation is going to actually make it to the, to the, to the Golden Master. So we'll, we'll see what happens with that and whether uh, Last.fm is actually going to ditch uh, the radio service or not. But, uh, you know, of course, I, I can imagine that people around the world might be interested in listening to more Last.fm content. But, uh, you know, having lost that functionality from the radio a while back, then uh, the YouTube fallback would be a pretty interesting um, other option for the service. And, uh, uh, you know, but the Grammys happened last week. Did you guys watch them? I missed the Grammys. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's all right. I read them. I read about them on the web. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I actually called them up on uh, what was it Monday night uh, here in the UK. Uh, and uh, you know, the televised part did really well actually ratings wise. They, they had 28 million viewers tuned into CBS. Uh, and it's the second best performance since 1993. There were a couple of standout performances uh, for me uh, personally, like Imagine Dragons were the the best ones uh, on the show that night. And uh, uh, Pink also did something pretty spectacular, if nothing else, for the athleticism displayed in what she was <laughs> in what she was doing. And singing at the same time like uh, keeping uh, keeping everything pretty uh, pretty smooth uh, and uh, one of the notable things of the night was the fact that the independents actually uh, gained uh, over 50 percent of the awards independent labels and uh, that's the biggest uh, uh, win in you know a2im's history so the history of independent labels in the in the u.s and of course you got macklemore and ryan lewis uh, who are classed as independents as a, you know they released the album on their own labels of course uh, with the help of uh, warner subsequently uh, they won uh, three or four awards i think uh, Vampire Weekend uh, from, with the XL Recordings uh, got, got Best Alternative Music Album for Modern Vampires of the City. Concord Music Group took home six uh, uh, awards uh, in different genres from blues to jazz to uh, roots and they, ha they had actually the most awards of the night uh, as label-wise. So, uh, Clyde, what do you make of uh, you know this rise of the indies? Uh, does it indicate that there is something in, in people that are saying that actually the market is shifting towards uh, uh, the uh, independent production, independent labels and that they have more of a chance to, to get heard, uh, uh, given the, the widespread distribution online and, and on digital services? Well, I, you know, the basic news that um, Indies did so well at the Grammys, I, I was really glad to hear that. Um, there's a lot of things that the Grammys don't tell you about what happened in the year, but um, seeing Indies get to this point is really powerful. Yeah. Um, obviously, the web's part of it, but... Um, I think also, as things have changed, I, I haven't really tracked, I'm not familiar with the full history of label services and the kinds of things that like uh, Macklemore and Lewis drew on to get their um, 
album distributed and to do the various things they did that an indie couldn't really pull off on their own. Yeah. So I think that development's been great. Um, there has been some discussion at certain points that they aren't really independent if they're getting services from the majors. I'm not, I think that's kind of a weird stance to take and would hold people back. I mean, it's a bit like a Adele, good, right? What? It's a bit like with Adele. What people, yeah. I mean, um, I think it's great. I'm, I'm, I think it's great. There, people are labels are providing the services and the distribution, and letting people do it in a lot of different ways. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Peter, from from your standpoint, you know, uh, do you, uh, how do you see uh, this market progress? Uh, and uh, uh, you know, from a branding perspective, you work a lot with the brands as well. Do you see that that's reflected in brands' uh, interest also in the independent market and how they want to place themselves uh, amongst uh, amongst uh, that group of artists and labels? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the first thing I think that you have an artist like Lord, you know, and you 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 hear the story of how she was discovered, and and if you if you actually watch, uh, there was an article written uh, about how Spotify helped break Lord and, and watch the virality of Lord take off, um, and I think that's going to become even much more um, uh, commonplace, yeah. where you have artists that you know appear in random parts of the world, and then all of a sudden, because of the internet, they have the ability to get that exposure. And uh, because of the tools and the, the like, Spotify or things of that nature, which shows trends, you can actually see them come to the fold very much faster. Yeah. Um, and that's what brands want to pick up on. I mean, a lot of advertisers are looking at who are these emerging artists because they want to get that cool factor. Um, so, and also, you know, they don't have to spend as much money. Sure. You know, me spending ten million dollars on a Little Wayne versus spending, you know, five hundred thousand on a new emerging artist that hasn't produced a name yet. Yeah, um, and and that's very telling, and I think for advertisers, it allows them to segment their audience into the certain target audiences um, that specific to certain you know genres or artists, and allow themselves to spread their media spend across a few artists instead of just one, yeah. Um, yeah. which is even a better, greater uh, potential if you know like about gambling and risk and stuff. So yeah, sure, absolutely, and mm. uh, you know it's it's also interesting to see. I mean, it's interesting to see the wins of the independent artists, but it's also interesting to see. The lack of independent artists in the televised part of the of the awards, I guess, because aside from Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, you know, it was really like a, a show uh, uh, of, uh, of of majors, uh, really. Uh, but uh, you know, on, on that front, uh, there was an interesting piece from Variety actually where there was uh, detailing what uh, could be fixed with the Grammys, and one of the things they were talking about was uh, fixing the the variety of uh, you know the. the contemporary nature of the acts that were nominated like for example they were making the example of uh, uh, the rock uh, nominations and of course we've seen the Led Zeppelin celebration won the best rock album and the best rock song went to Come Some Slack uh, from Dave Grohl's Sound City which also included the old timer Paul McCartney so uh, you know that's uh, that's an interesting one and uh, um, uh, and Variety also points out to the fact that the window for the Grammys is quite weird because uh, most of the releases that come out at the end of the year uh, are not included so in that, that very important Q4. So a lot of uh, the people that end up uh, being nominated are, you know, are albums that came out maybe at the tail end of 2012, which feels like a long time ago if you do the ceremony at the end of uh, January. So, uh, Clyde, do you think that th there's something that can be improved there in maybe changing the window of, of uh, sort of uh, people being able to be nominated in, uh, on, on, on these awards? Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, well, I guess. I mean... These end of the weird year stuff is always so weird. I mean, yeah. I know like at Hypebot, I was like, or beginning of December, I'm getting all these end of the year, best of 2013 lists. And it's so not over. But by the time we'd gotten a bunch of those from big names, when it really got to be the end of year, it was like nobody wanted to really talk about it. And people stopped reading those articles. So. Yeah. Um, those kind of schedules are always odd to me. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. Sure, uh, Peter, do you think that uh, you know the scheduling has an effect on uh, uh, on on you know how people perceive the Grammys? You know, for example, if you see an album that came out what what it feels like ages ago, uh, come on and win the best album prize, you know, are people still going to be as interested in the in the in the in the awards as they would if uh, uh, they could see all of uh, Q4 uh, 2013 releases uh, as part of the ceremony as well? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, to me, I thought I was listening to a lot of old music. I was surprised yeah. by, by a lot of the tracks that were being recommended. 
Um, and I do think that if you're going to have the Grammys in January of 2014, that should, you have time enough to, to make certain that it's all 2013 tracks. Yeah. Um, I, I, I find it weird, but I'm kind of new to all of the, you know, Grammy selection process and all that stuff. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't understand it. I was kind of surprised by a lot of the, 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 the choices. Um, you know, you saw Macklemore even write that he thought Kendrick Lamar should have won yeah. best album of the year. So Absolutely. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> okay, Prince, that's fun. Uh, so, so guys, uh, Prince uh, generated a few headlines this week. Uh, very exciting for me in London because apparently Prince is going to play some uh, uh, yet-to-be-announced dates in the capital in iconic venues. But th that's actually nice. supposed to happen in early February. So, I mean, it's almost early February. So we're going to have to see if and when these dates are announced. Uh, um, uh, but Prince also made the headlines for, uh, unfortunately, a, a more negative uh, story, which is the fact that he decided to sue 22 fans for $22 million uh, and uh, uh, decided, uh, you know, that uh, uh, the bootlegs that these fans had linked to uh, were s such an abomination, and you know, such a, a stain on his reputation as an artist that he had to sue them and he had to, uh, you know, see that they were uh, punished for, for being such a uh, big fans of his music I guess uh, so unfortunately you know, that's what happened but actually TMZ reported yesterday that uh, whether it's following the backlash uh, PR wise or whether it's it's following Mike Masnick's piece on Tech Dirt which was uh, awesome and outlined all the legal flaws in the, in the lawsuit uh, he decided to take it all back and the suit was dropped oh, okay. yesterday so uh, you know the prince that we know would have probably carried this all the way even if it meant going to the Supreme Court <laughs> at least uh, <laughs> the prince from a few years back so uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you make of it, and what do you make of the, what do you make of the fact that he eventually dropped uh, the charges? Uh, Pete, uh, uh, any thoughts on Prince? Uh, I, I just think that anytime you sue your fans, it's a bad idea. I mean, come on, <laughs> you know, and the guy's got millions of fans. I just feel like uh, you know he's just he's just hurting his his own reputation. Yeah, um, I, I you know I have nothing else to say about that. I, I really don't. I, I think that you know if if artists aren't going to accept the internet, they're not going to accept you know, the progress that we're making in terms of technology, um, then you might as well stop playing music because it's inevitable. And it's just, it's, you know, I mean, it's just something that's going to happen. And you, your fans are on there. They're going to be sharing. They're going to be, you know, trying. Like, I guess people were using some of the uh, music and making mixes. And, yeah, I can understand in terms of copyright. But at the same point, um, you know, you, you have a, a strong fan base that is just basically sharing the love of your music. Yeah. Uh, why go after them? Why not go after some, like maybe the sites or things that is actually, you know, supporting. If, if you're going to go after anybody, don't go after your fans. That's no. all. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's that's right. And uh, uh, you know, Clyde, have you have you followed uh, Prince's uh, uh, sort of history over the years? And uh, you know, do you think that uh, the backlash that was generated by the fact that this was reported, it, it came out essentially, uh, may have led to sort of a, a him deciding to drop the guard on it, or, or you know, decide to drop the suit, or uh, you know, why would you think he would have had a change of heart otherwise? I don't know. He's uh, his royal badness. It's hard. <laughs> Who knows how he operates? But um, there is a weird thing that seems to happen when you're you get really rich and famous. Is you're suddenly surrounded by people who are gonna do what you say, right? And maybe they aren't gonna push back when they need to, or the people that push back are eliminated. So. When you have somebody who has a really different take on things and maybe it just doesn't like the internet, a lot of not everybody loves the internet, <laughs> you know, his ability to like scope out the details, um, you know, is going to be hindered. I mean, who knows what was happening with that lawyer? If Masnick was correct about his critique of that, the um, case uh, or the, um, the, law, the lawsuit being brought. Yeah. Or, you know, all the whatever legal actions, whatever you call that group of legal actions, um, you wonder, I mean, is that lawyer still there because she just does what Prince tells her to do? Yeah. You know, it's kind of it's kind of weird. And also, I'm glad they took it back, though. Those 22 fans were going to, their lives were going to get really ruined for a while, Absolutely. maybe for a really long time. And yeah. that's something people like Prince need to take into account. Yeah, you know these are real human beings on the other end, so yeah. that kind of bothers me. 
Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, uh, thankfully, uh, the, the suit actually only named two uh, of the defendants by name. Uh, I think all the others were URLs or Facebook mm. usernames or stuff like that. So uh, thankfully, not that many of the identities of the fans actually uh, came out. And who knows actually where they were located. I mean, it may well be that they just found the 22 fans and they may have been located anywhere in the world, which would have made the lawsuit an absolute nightmare in terms of uh, you know implementation and, and prosecution of uh, any of these fans. So uh, hopefully they came to their senses and, and decided to, to take this back. Uh, but I'm still excited about the dates in London, so we're going we're to see what happens there. Yeah. And uh, but I would just uh, I would just recommend anybody that goes Definitely. to see the gigs not it's quickly forgotten. <laughs> yeah, but uh, don't don't uh -huh. ta don't take out your phone if you, if you go to one of those gigs because uh, you might get arrested. So <laughs> just make sure your phone stays firmly in your pocket, and uh, and I uh, think you'll be fine. <laughs> if they catch you recording anything, that's it. Uh, and uh, uh, there were a couple of bits of news coming from Rap Genius actually that were pretty interesting uh, out of uh, uh, New York this week, and the company announced uh, a deal with Universal Music publishing which is our second major uh, publishing deal after the one announced with Sony ATV in the latter part of 2013 so that's that's good news for them it means that they're becoming more uh, you know sort of uh, legitimate as as a service uh, having been on some of the lists of uh, naughtiest uh, you know or you know uh, worst companies for for copyright uh, you know infringement uh, from some of the organization uh, the copyright organizations over the last year uh, in other news the company uh, has also announced uh, more significantly an iOS uh, app which uh, is simply called genius I guess they want to start getting rid of the associations with uh, purely rap music and uh, you know the, it offers a really slick experience it, it's really good uh, it's got a Shazam like instant song recognition it can scan your iTunes library uh, it links out, out to YouTube and it has a SoundCloud embeds right in, within the app if the SoundCloud uh, track is available on the service uh, so uh, a lot of uh, pretty cool features and it works pretty seamlessly so uh, you know is Rap Genius coming of age and uh, you know as a service that can really become the de facto a place to, to consume lyrics and in, in that sense can it also threaten some of the other lyric services that are out there. Uh, 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 from uh, uh, from uh, your New York perspective, uh, what do you think, uh, uh, Pete? I think, I think they're doing a great job. I mean, you know, they keep, they keep getting in trouble with likes of Google and, you know, the labels, but, uh, you know, they have... Lyrics, I mean, it's just so easily searchable online and they have an immense presence and they've got a community that's being built yeah, um, yeah. and they started with a really, you know, passionate community with hip hop and rap. So um, I think, you know, they, they have, uh, they, they still got a long ways to go, but I think they're doing, they're doing the right thing um, and they're, they're, they're being more reactive than proactive. Yeah. Um, but from a business standpoint, I think that's, you know, suing them well because they care more about what the users are doing than what they care about the auxiliary businesses that are affected. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I, I'd like to see where they continue to head. I've heard different things about how they're going to expand beyond music and, and such. But, you know, for, for me, it seems like they've got a really uh, good, good hold on the lyric market. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And uh, Clyde, uh, on your on, on your end, you know, from a, from a uh, sort of music tech uh, uh, reporter point of view, you know, what, what do you think? Uh, where do you think Rap Genius is heading? Uh, and uh, uh, you know, is the app a key component to that to that growth? Because of course, you know, uh, that that's really gonna make them in a way independent of Google as well. Oh, I see. Which okay, independent of Google. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's um, the app's a smart move. It makes sense. Um, I think I've always been wondered about how Rap Genius could move beyond lyrics. I mean, moving beyond hip hop lyrics alone is difficult when you look at the I don't know, I just feel like there's a lot of separation, you know, the um like I'm into hip hop, but when I was writing about it, I was always surprised at how many of my educated white friends were kind of tripped out that I was writing about hip hop and they'd ask me, do you actually listen to it? And, and this was just, I mean, I'm talking about just five years ago. So that makes me wonder about how they get beyond being rap genius. Right. And I can see it working out eventually with lyrics, but you know, there's all this stuff when you're dependent on Google as they have been, then you can get other lyrics up and people will find them through Google, but um, through the search engine, but that, you know, I, I really, I'll be curious to know how other uh, aspects beyond the rap lyrics are doing, but yeah. I could see them being very big in lyrics. There are a lot of unlicensed uh, sites. They have a nice, they do a good job with that. Um, 
I'm not sure how it'll go beyond the lyric space, though, to be yeah. honest. But, you know, maybe they'll pull it off. Yeah. Certainly, licensing is a really... They kind of had to do it, but it's also the right thing and a good thing to do. Yeah. So, especially with the funding that they had that they received, it's kind of hard to stay yeah, away from yeah, the licensing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Especially with the millions of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of you, yeah, it's difficult to justify at that point when you have uh, that money in the bank not to do the deals. Uh, but, you know, the app when you started out actually says uh, uh, lyrics, uh, poetry, and prose. So, I guess their aim is to be the reference point to explain almost anything that comes into the realm of the written word uh, mm -hmm. in a wider sense. So, it's going to be interesting to see whether they actually decide to get into the book space, for example, or, or how, they, how they do that and, uh, uh, and whether that could have some interesting applications for, uh, you know, literature, but we're gonna have to see. That would be quite funny coming from a company that started as a, as a rap lyrics site. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, looking at uh, uh, the next thing that I want to talk about, uh, that would be a quick jump into China, actually. I wanted to just move out of our Western comfort zone and move uh, into China where Josh Hall is at Tech, Tech in Asia reported about 10 days ago that Baidu has launched a new hardware product, which is a wireless music streaming box that retails for 99 yuan or $16 and can be connected to any sort of set of household speakers uh, uh, to broadcast music from uh, uh, smartphones, essentially, uh, from services like Xiaomi in China, Baidu Music, Douban FM, Domi Music, QQ Music, and others. Uh, and in other news from China, also so the PRS for Music magazine reported that the International Confederation of Authors and Composers Societies, which is CISAC, has opened an office in Beijing after successfully negotiating with the, the Chinese authorities and uh, uh, securing their support. So uh, these two news together sort of kind of keep uh, pointing me in, in the direction of a China that is opening up uh, to uh, sort of... Uh, the so Western, I guess, uh, uh, approach to music consumption, which is a more sort of rights-oriented one, and uh, uh, that the, the country might actually uh, start tightening its its copyright laws, which it already has done uh, in, in on paper. There's a few bills I think that are going through uh, through in China at the moment that are looking at doing just that as well, and so it, it could actually become an interesting area uh, of expansion. Whilst you know right now it's still a very small industry uh, in terms of recorded music uh, revenues. Uh, uh, Clyde, do you see a lot of companies that are are, are looking at China yet in the music space? Is it something that you see mentioned uh, at times, or are people still fairly uh, sort of wary of of where the country's stance is on music? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I haven't seen. It seems uh, occasionally I've kept up with uh, what more independent artists are trying to do, touring in China, building a base there. I know that activity is kind of ongoing. You just don't. You don't see it unless you dig for it. Yeah, I don't know what's happening with, um, like, with other music interests. I know, I know some, uh, like Paul McCartney did a big messaging app ad campaign based or a brand, not an ad campaign, but he had an account on one of the big messaging yeah, services. Right. Was that uh, was that Chinese? I think that was Chinese. Yeah, uh... I think so. But um. Other than that, I haven't, I'm not hearing, a, I a keep up deal, with China yeah. quite a bit, but I'm not hearing a lot. Yeah. I thought the, um, the music box, I'm not sure what it was called, um, but the piece of hardware was interesting yeah. news. I didn't write about it because we don't really cover hardware so much, but yeah. this whole thing of services struggling for the music services trying to get into the living room through the TV is... It interested me in relationship to that yeah. because if you're, you know, with a TV, there's this thing of you have to turn it on and make a choice. With something that plays music, you know, like the radio or whatever, you usually just turn it on. It's already at your station. I th there may be a chance for a dedicated piece of hardware like that that's different and more attuned to the web and stuff to um, make some moves in that area. Yeah. Yeah, Possibly. essentially, uh, essentially like no, like a, a tiny like Sonos component like component without the speaker, which is just like essentially the hardware to hook up to speakers. I think mm -hmm. there's a few things on Amazon that are sort of uh, actually made in China. I think that are relatively cheap to do that, but I just don't know to what kind of level of of of. Uh, mm -hmm efficiency that's that's possible right now uh, to be honest i got like a, a really cheap bluetooth speaker somewhere around here uh, it must be <laughs> yeah, it's somewhere around here uh, and it's it's lovely it sounds actually quite nice but it, there's a lot of like 
very basic uh, hardware issues with it like uh, uh, for example if you uh, if you leave it on and then it starts losing charge it starts beeping like crazy which uh, if you leave it on uh, during the night that's not good because it just wakes you up and stuff like that you know just basic things that you know haven't been worked out so uh, i'd be interested in seeing a, a more sort of established player that looks after some of the finer aspects of of hardware software uh, sort of integration to create some of those boxes and see how they perform in the marketplace uh, and uh, Peter, uh, on your end, uh, have, have you seen a lot of brands uh, looking at China? You know, do, is there anything that you guys do at the moment that has any China-facing aspects? And have you looked into the country as a potential uh, place to to do business? I mean, I've seen there's some huge campaigns going on in China at the moment. I was there in November, and they had like a massive car arc billboard campaign with uh, uh, I think it was One Direction. They were everywhere yes. and stuff like that. So there, there are also some a lot of Western elements that are brought into China, but I just don't know. Online, the space is just seems so restricted with all the different laws and, and things that are into place. Yeah, it, it, I mean, so far we haven't actually tapped any of the. We haven't done anything in China. Um, yeah. We've been all on the outside, so we've done stuff in Singapore, Malaysia, Taiwan. Um, but yeah, we haven't gotten into China, and mostly it's because uh, who we work with. Uh, you know, usually we're going hand in hand with a music service provider of some sort. Um, but yeah, China seems like this frontier that might be, uh, it might take a while for a lot of people to kind of get into, um, in terms yeah. of digital music. Yeah. And it doesn't look like, you know, a normal s streaming service, like the ones that we already know, uh, could l just literally expand into China because the, the, the licensing models, the way that people are monetizing music right now is just so different. I just can't see a, a Deezer or a Spotify launch in China right now. Yeah. Uh, that could be quite tricky. I mean, hopefully Spotify will launch in Japan at some point this year, which could be fun to see because Japan is kind of a, a relatively backward. Also, be yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a relatively backwards yeah. industry still. So. <laughs> <laughs> and so that that could be quite fun to see uh, whether they actually start adopting streaming as as a as a thing uh, whilst they're still consuming so much physical. Uh, but yeah, China is, is still kind of a black box right now. Um, and uh, uh, finally, uh, I wanted to talk about Sweden. Of course, I kind of have to touch upon it. I try and avoid talking too much about stats because it seems like every week uh, in January we get a new country revealing its uh, own uh, sort of IFPI or whatever sort of recorded music revenues from 2013. It seems like they're timing them week after week almost to get as much press as possible for each country that reveals the stat uh, but uh, this uh, this week it was sweden and they revealed a five percent increase in recorded music revenues in 2013 streaming rose 30 percent and uh, now represents 72 percent of the country's total music revenues which is huge uh, of course sweden is a, a birthplace of spotify has been a testing ground for the company from the beginning and uh, you know broadband penetration is huge so that's also a big factor and a lot of people that i speak to tell me you know don't look at the uh, uh, Sweden as you know maybe for some territories it may be something that might happen uh, there as well you know four or five years time Sweden might be ahead of time in, in that sense but also the situation in Sweden is so specific that it's hard to see it being applied to somewhere like the US for example where you have so many different types of services uh, on the streaming spectrum which are from like sort of totally uh, on demand to uh, totally not on demand like curated services uh, uh, like Pandora so uh, uh, you know Pete do you see you know, of course, you know, I, I don't want you to comment on Sweden because, you know, there's, there's not much point. We're not there uh, uh, ourselves. But as far as the U.S. is concerned, uh, you know, do you, do you feel like in three or four years time we could start getting into uh, a place where uh, the stats will, might start to resemble Sweden's and uh, where st streaming really becomes uh, the major uh, slice of the pie when it comes to recording music revenues? Yeah, I definitely think so. I think it's the trend. I mean, it's picking up and uh, that's where everything's headed. And, and I think it's just going to take a while. You know, a launch like Beats is really going to help, uh, you know, push into the mainstream uh, and, and get users actually uh, acquainted with the idea of, you know, paying a subscription for music. Um, you know, Spotify's done a great job, but, you know, getting into the U.S. market, it's difficult because people are still stuck in iTunes. They're still, you know, thinking about their, their even their CDs, some, some of them. Um, yeah. You know, I, I find it funny when I speak to, you know, friends in my circles that are just finding out about Spotify, you know, and have no idea about Beats. So yeah, I think it's going to take about two or three years, but that it's, it's inevitable. I think it's going to happen. And, and uh, you know, we're all going to have, you know, the Sonos, uh, Sonos systems or the Baidu's and those things accessing these streaming music services. We're all going to have playlists. We're going to have curators. It's going to get uh, very, very cool. And I think Sweden is showing that the beginning of it, um, just because they are a smaller market and they're much more tech savvy. Um, and they've had the ability to, you know, use Spotify for the last five years. Yeah. 
Sure. Clyde, do you agree with Pete? Uh, you know, where do you see, uh, it's one of the core debates on the show is where do we, do we see streaming going in the US? Uh, part of the debate is also generated by the fact that we don't know how many of the people that already subscribe to Pandora, which is a lot, are actually going to be willing to, uh, you know, also use another service at the same time. Oh, man, there's so many questions. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are just so many services. There's so much behavior that's changing. Like when Pete was talking about Sweden, well, not you weren't just talking about Sweden, but um, I started thinking about. I, w- I wonder what their internet service is like there, and their the their mobile um, service because a lot of these other countries have much better streaming, both uh, to the desktop and to mobile. Right. Um, we don't. We've the U.S. has made a huge mistake in letting the cable companies and stuff throttle our speed. Yeah. Um, I could go on and on about that for a while, but if you're interested, look at the municipal broadband movement. Look at all the cable companies that have stopped states like North Carolina, where I live. Uh, cities are no longer able to do their own municipal broadband, and that's where the real speeds come from. Now, what they often bring is when they do that, a lot of these cities will do like free Wi-Fi throughout the downtown Um of course, mobile streaming is a different topic, but there's an infrastructure thing that's going to slow down some of the streaming shift, I think. But right. I agree. Uh, I think um, it's uh, it seems pretty inevitable in certain senses. Um, certainly, I think, I don't know, a lot of the beha- uh, radio-type listening will shift over both to web radio and to Spotify, or things like Spotify that aren't exactly web radio or that are introducing things that are like web radio. Yeah. But, um, man, there are just so many players. It's, it's hard to know. Yeah. It's hard to know how this will work out. What, where the wind is going to go. So that the whole idea of throttling and the ability to download data, like my phone service provider only gives me two gigabytes a month. Uh, uh, it's, uh. That's not that's fun. nothing, <laughs> <laughs> and I pay a lot of money for it too. So yeah, I bet, I bet, I bet. I feel very lucky here in the UK. I've got I'm on unlimited broadband here uh, with the BT. It's only about you know, fifty bucks a month for wow. uh, seventy or eighty megs down per second and about ten upload. Uh, completely unlimited, no monitoring or anything, no throttling uh, of any sort. Uh, so, yeah, I feel very lucky about that. <laughs> um, you know, also on the mainstreaming, uh, Beats is, you know, they're going to have a Super Bowl uh, commercial with Ellen DeGeneres. I just found out, that just started to get out yesterday. So, their campaign, I think, is going to bring a lot of stuff to the mainstream. Whether they grab all that, how that works out, you know, that's another, that's going to be an interesting thing to watch play out. Yeah. But the mainstream is going to know about streaming after the next month or so, if yeah. they don't already. <laughs> and uh, and last week, actually, we didn't manage to really uh, talk about, like, we didn't have a chance to mention the fact that Beats had quite a few issues uh, in the first few days of service uh, with the volume of users that were joining, joining it, and so they actually had to shut down access to the service uh, to sort out those issues. People were having uh, random restarts of the app, and, uh, you know, they had to uh, input the same information several times on the app before it actually stuck, and stuff like that. So uh, it's going to be interesting to monitor, because the uh, Super Bowl is only about a week away now. Uh, uh, or less, right? Is that just a few days yeah, out? It happens actually this Sunday. Oh, this Sunday. So if they yeah. do have a Super Bowl advert, that's going to drive a huge amount of traffic to the service. So it's really going to be interesting to see whether in the two weeks that follow the launch, they had enough time to sort out all of the uh, the bugs that were creating problems uh, at the beginning. Oh, uh, yeah. I bet they're working hard. <laughs> yeah, I bet they're working really hard. <laughs> Man, stressing out. <laughs> Considering how much, uh, how much a Super Bowl advert costs as well. You, know? yeah. <laughs> you want to make the most of that. You don't want users to go to the site and find, oh, sorry, we sign up with the email we can't really take any new users at the moment so mm-hmm. that would be a bit of a bummer uh, but uh, yeah it's going to be quite fun to see I'm looking forward to seeing the advert actually I want to see what kind of angle they put to the to the service as well because we've seen some attempts at advertising from other streaming services before like uh, Pete you, you will have seen last what was in la- late 2012 in New York when I did a massive billboard campaign in Times Square and elsewhere in New York uh, yeah. which was kind of like it wasn't really explanatory in, in, in what Ardu did or how the service worked it was just a branding exercise in a sense uh, yeah. so it's going to be interesting to see whether Beats goes all out and actually explains what streaming is and what the company does or whether they actually just 
tell people to go to beatsmusic.com and check out this new streaming service and hope that people get it from that. I think they've done, they've done such a great job on the hardware side with their headphones and yeah. they've got those artists like Dr. Dre lined up. I think, you know, making that, uh, that jump right into digital music st- streaming, it's pretty easy for them, I think, and, and educating them just with those artists alone, just being like, our music is here, you know? Right. Uh, so we shall see. But I think, yeah, they've got a great marketing engine. They got a lot of money to spend on it. So. Nope. Yeah, absolutely. So that's uh, it's definitely going to be an interesting challenge to see. Although the challenge for them is that they don't have a free tier. So definitely uh, 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 an interesting uh, thing to look at because, uh, you know, just a week's worth of free trial is not going to be enough for most users. So, yeah. uh, And, you know, also um, they're going from marketing a product you buy once to marketing a subscription you pay for every month. And yeah. I don't know how that will play into all this, but obviously that's a very different thing. Although... Pretty much everybody's used to subscriptions now of some form, just paying their cell phone bill and other stuff. But yeah. I'm curious to see if that affects it as well. Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, I, I want to let you guys go because uh, uh, we've uh, kind of run long today. But I, I really want to first uh, uh, let you, uh, you, know, you know, have, a, have a, a chat about uh, what you guys are up to. So, uh, first of all, Clyde, on Hypebot, uh, you know, just uh, uh, tell people briefly about, uh, you know, what you guys do. Of course, uh, uh, most people will be aware of Hypebot <laughs> that listen to the show. I would, I would hope so anyway. So, <laughs> but uh, anyway, just, just uh, go for it. Well, um, at Hypebot, you know, we're a general music industry publication, but um, I focus, pri- we're doing a lot of music tech. I think we, in terms of individual items, we're probably covering the broader, broadest range of music tech companies, from what I can tell. That's a big thing. I put a lot of energy into that. Yeah. Um, and of course, we're also, I'm trying to keep DIY and indie music in that mix, and so is Bruce uh, Hofton, our editor and publisher. And then um, I'm going to be representing Hypebot at an upcoming uh, MIA Music Summit in Miami in February. Um, and I think you're also going to be on there, is that yes, correct? Yes, absolutely. So uh, we're going to actually meet in person, which is good. Yeah, that'll be nice. <laughs> Absolutely, and uh, yeah, this is uh, the Miami uh, uh, Summit, which uh, is uh, on, uh, sorry, I lost the website, mms.co, for anybody who wants to go and check it out. Uh, the Miami Music Summit is going to take place uh, uh, towards the, t- uh, the, the third week, of, of uh, fourth Let's week uh, of... Uh, March 24th. March 24th, that's right. Yes. Uh, so that's going to be quite fun. If you are in the uh, Miami uh, area, uh, definitely check it out. And if you're not, uh, go and check it out anyway. You might want to fly there. So uh, yeah, definitely a, a conference to keep an eye on on and uh, Peter from from your end uh, uh, you know just briefly of course if people haven't uh, seen the one-to-one show uh, what do you guys do at F-sharp and uh, how does it work? Yeah so we're, we're basically focused on the the future of branded entertainment online um, you know and uh, the idea is basically that brands are getting much more interested in digital music and you're seeing that happen much more uh, across different streaming services like Spotify um, and Pandora uh, and it's not just banner ads anymore it's more about uh, interactive. It's more about engaging engagement and figuring out ways of how do you target that audience as an advertiser yeah. um, and how do you reach out to the audience that's already engaging with music. So they're already consuming music. Um, now how do we figure out how can we make sure that we're behind that right? as an advertiser? How do we sponsor the content that they like to consume so that we get affiliated with that, that good content as well? Um, and I, I really, I think the approach is, it's great because we're taking the, the way that you perceive advertising today as, as a nuisance, as, you know, an interruption to your enjoyable experience online. And we're, we're making it so it's, no, we're, the brand is actually bringing you that experience. The brand yeah. is actually bringing you new music to discover. Um, and we're doing that right now a lot and worldwide actually with Spotify. And, and now we're actually working with some new uh, music service providers. Um, and we have our own product called the Ad Player, which uh, was just released at the end of last year. Um, that is actually what got a few brands lined up actually for Q2. So, Great. 
um, I guess, uh, keep plugged and, uh, you know, go to fsharp.com, E-F-S-H-A-R-P.com, check out more. So. That's great. So, yeah, it's uh, efsharp.com and hypebot.com. Thanks so much, guys, for uh, taking the time to come on the show. I'm going to be at Medium uh, from uh, uh, Friday. And then next week's show is going to be actually a Medium special. So it's not going to be a usual news show, but a bit of a collection of all the interviews that I'm going to uh, produce uh, during Medium. I've got about 25 plus interviews lined up already in my calendar. So it's getting pretty hectic for a four day. Day, uh, show uh, but it's going to be quite fun so definitely tune in to next week's show and find out all about uh, Medem uh, 2014 uh, thanks so much for listening uh, have a fantastic week and until next time <laughs>